So please join me in welcoming Dory Dunstall. Um, so I always begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron Wendat, who are the original owners and custodians. Um, upon the land, Tuckeronto, in which I am gathered. Um, but I, knowing this is COVID, so many of us are gathered in many different places of the world. I, uh, SVA headquarters in New York City is on the lands of the uh, Lenape people, uh, correct? Um, um, but doing the land acknowledgement is a really important um, process in terms of, of how we position ourselves in terms of decolonization. Um, so everywhere I go, when I travel around the world, I actually find out, try to find out who are the uh, traditional to owners of the land, um, which is really funny when you go to places like London. <laughs> um, but it's an important part of just recognizing, recognizing um, the land, recognizing our um, positionalities um, and recognizing how we need to go forward with an intentionality of respect and an intentionality of support for indigenous sovereignty. Um, so I'm gonna talk about decolonizing design when diversity and inclusion is not enough. Um, it's really just a way to kind of talk about um, my career Oh, well, not, not my full career, but career elements of my career and kind of um, some of the journeys around getting to a place where, let's say, I feel I belong is probably the best way to say it in, in the world of design. Um, so I'm going to tell you three stories. Well, I'm going to tell you more than that, but I'm going to start with three stories. I'm going to tell you a story how diversity is not enough, inclusion is not enough but how decolonizing design is just right. And just how it's been just right, and particularly for me um, at OCAD University. Um, so they say diversity is getting invited to the party. Yay, I'm invited. Um, <laughs> and it's, um, it's one of those things I think, you know, as, as uh, cis, a female gendered a black um, person of like quasi working class, middle class background. Um, like I'm always expected to be um, happy for the invitation to the party. And again, as people of color, LGBTQ, Muslim working class folk, people with disabilities, we're all supposed to be really happy to receive the invitation because it reflects the fact that we, we're wanted and, you know, the way in which um, systems of exclusion happens is that they, you know, communicate quite often to you um, that you're not wanted. And so the invitation is important. And, you know, I'm talented enough and old enough now that I've actually received lots of invitations, you know. Um, so Remar, Stanford University, my first job, real paying job at eLab slash Sapient, Arc Worldwide, working on design for democracy with AIGA, uh, working at the University of Illinois at Chicago, leading the US National Design Policy Initiative, moving all the way to Australia um, to work at Swinburne University, and then now where I'm currently at, which is OCAD University. So I've received lots of invitations and again, quite grateful for them. Um, <laughs> but, the moral of the story, right, is that um, diversity is not enough. Um, so oftentimes when I come into these spaces, I often bring the diversity. Um, so again, um, the first place where I experience that kind of maximum diverse, optimized diversity is actually uh, in my graduate program in anthropology at Stanford University. Um, and so I use this image because like when I walked it, coming from growing up in Indianapolis, Indiana in the Midwest, like there's a way in which the world was seen very kind of black and white. Um, so to go to California and literally, and I, and I still describe it this way, like to walk into a United Colors of Benetton ad, which is what this is, United Colors of Benetton ad, uh, from um, Olivero uh, Toscani's uh, Scola ad, 
like to walk into that level of diversity was amazing for me and um, transformative in many ways because, you know, like I, um, in my first class with, you know, Chicano anthropologists um, teaching it, my colleagues were, um, let's see, we had uh, two, two African Americans, one of which who was biracial, one half Jamaican, half uh, sort of white American person. We had uh, one colleague from India, one colleague who was Indo-American, uh, one colleague from Japan, one colleague from China, one colleague uh, from, we had so many indigenous colleagues that we actually had to learn their um, community and tribal names. So I met my first person who was Métis, um, which now I know lots of them here in Canada. Uh, uh, we had Lenape, um, Ho-Chuck, um, um, Carib, as in like the original Caribbean people from the Caribbean. Um, and it was one of those things, it was so amazing to be in this diversity of individuals that um, I named our group uh, the Congress of the Oppressed because the only white person, um, the only white people in that cohort were a Jewish uh, white woman and a homosexual uh, white man. <laughs> and so in this context of, again, optimized diversity, the most interesting thing happened when you put us all in a room together. And that thing was, is that we actually began to oppress one another. And part of the reason why was that in many of our situations, we were the only one. So to see so much diversity respect in, in the classroom is like, it was the first time that we would be able to really like speak out to say our voice, to, to explain who we are. And the voice that came out was that of a European um, continental, uh, you know, let's say French queer philosopher, if you're talking about Foucault. <laughs> Um, because all of us in our languages of like what it meant to be an intellectual, what it meant to be at Stanford University, um, that our model of what it meant to be in these spaces was not the model of our own identities, was, but was a model of sort of in some ways a, you know, a European man. And so we oppressed each other because we were all trying to try on in each other and speak our like, you know, our post-structuralist vocabularies with each other. And so it was really interesting because like, we, like you, we all were sort of having these weird sort of feelings where it's like, I'm in the most diverse community that I've ever been in in my life. And I hate going to class. <laughs> How is it that I hate going to class? Because like, this is all of when I was the only one in my class, like this is what I dreamed of. Um, and so again, being, relatively clever people, we sort of figured this out. And what we decided to do is like, okay, well, what's the, what's the problem? What's going on here? And what we realized is that we weren't bringing ourselves. We weren't bringing ourselves. And so uh, Maria Corteras, who is Chicana, um, and I, we started it off where we were supposed to sort of give a presentation and we, um, and we brought in French hip hop, and uh, all this foods, like our favorite foods, and we brought them into the class, and and we talked about like what does it mean to have like French hip hop and coming from you know hip hop coming from sort of a you know, assumed to be an African American culture, and what does it mean for it to travel these places, and and it was a thing where we did that, and then the next week someone came in and they brought um, poetry. Um, from their community. I think this was sort of, um, they brought um, kind of uh, sort of Japanese American readings from um, the internment, um, internment camps. Um, the next week, uh, others brought in like music and food. And so what happened is that in the second half of that class, we were able to find a space 
to create an education that reflected us, to reflected our histories, reflected our, we were in, you know, I would use the language now, we were decolonizing our education to create a space for our communities and our heritages to be part of the education system at Stanford University. But getting invited was not enough. <laughs> because what happened is that we started um, bringing these decolonizing approaches into our other anthropology classes, into our other modern thought and literature classes. And in some ways, uh, not all, but let's say half of the faculty freaked out, completely freaked out. And they freaked out so much that they went to the provost and said, um, we need to have a separate anthropology program that um, is focused on anthropological sciences. Um, and basically, um, these professors were, you know, white and male, probably all over the age of 60, um, and were really disturbed by having these United Color of Bennington kids, right, in their classrooms, bringing their language, bringing their culture. Um, and so the provost agreed and they split the anthropology department into two. Um, and after that, so, so the next cohort that came was super diverse in the same sort of way because as students, you know, I was on the graduate student committee. Um, we, again, sought to replicate that kind of diversity. But then afterwards, when the program split, um, there was some money that came in for the Ford Foundation to provide funding for students from Eastern Europe, right? So then that sort of disappeared. Um, and then again, with the split between uh, the other program in anthropological sciences, what they really wanted in many ways is just to replicate their sort of white maleness um, with this sort of very scientific, um, authority um, that they weren't able to inculcate with our students. So this is a thing where diversity is not enough um, because in the face of diversity, you have to actually really, really change the power structure. Um, and so getting invited, right, is not enough if there aren't people in the power structure who are willing to support that change. And so what broke down in the context of Stanford is that, again, as students, we were bringing the change and some of our faculty was allowing us to bring the change because you, again, they represented the diversity as well. Um, but the institution in and of itself, which was, again, run by individuals who were um, threatened by that diversity, they shut it down. Now, again, that was like 20 something years ago. So things have changed and kind of gone back to normal and the community has got together. But the impact of that sort of split was really tremendous. Like half of my cohort and the following cohorts didn't finish their PhDs, right? Because diversity was not enough. Um, so first takeaway, getting invited is ineffective if it doesn't actually change the actual power structure of an institution or a firm. Um, so that's diversity. So let's turn to the story of inclusion. So inclusion, they say, is getting asked to dance. And which again, you all know I love to dance, so this is really good. Um, so, um, and again, I've been quite, um, quite, fortunate in that, you know, like my dance card has been pretty full. Um, and interestingly enough that some of the, the my dance partners um, um, who've brought me in to sort of really be inclusive have been, you know, white men. Um, and that is a really, really good thing because that's required in order to make, again, these structural institutional changes. Um, but again, it's a thing where you know, sometimes inclusion is not enough. So I'll tell you a secret, I was actually mm, pushed out of one of my high tech jobs. I'll say pushed out, but the, 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 the HR term is actually bullied, uh, but I say pushed out. 
Um, so the context for this was that um, I was working really late doing um, consulting um, along with the rest of the team. And the project director came in and did what I describe and others describe as a swoop and poop. So they basically came in, you know, looked at the work that we had done as a team, working 80 hours to 100 hours per week because we were coming up to a deadline and was like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, and this sucks. And then was going to walk out of the room. <laughs> so I, maybe with the lack of sleep, or maybe it's because, you know, like I'm African-American and I don't take BS very well. Um, I called out and I just sort of said, well, you know, that was actually really disrespectful because all of us have been working really, really hard on this and you haven't even listened to the rationales behind our decision. Um, so everyone was shocked. And then, you know, the, the director left the room. And then within the next day, you know, I came into the work and my colleagues wouldn't look me in the eye they weren't able to look me in the eye. So I knew something was going on. And then within the week, um, like again, you know, all the plum assignments that I had been sort of allocated to, um, like I began to get pulled off of those assignments and reassigned. Um, and then the following week, there was all these meetings that was held about Dory, but not inviting Dory, right, to sort of, I don't even know what they said, right? Because it was a thing I wasn't even invited to talk about why I would have made this kind of comment or what it sort of means. And so this went on where like, again, over the period of, um, you know, six weeks or so, I was completely ostracized. Um, now I, again, thinking about that, like this is, this is where inclusion is not enough. Right. Because, again, you know, as an African-American, we we sing about respect, you know, R-E-S-P-C-T, find out what it means to me. Like that is such a core aspect of the the desire for recognition of how, let's say, black lives matter. Um, so for me to speak up in terms of a context of being disrespected and the team being disrespected is not unusual. Right. And that's part of like, if you're going to bring those identities into these institutions, in these spaces, it should be expected, right? It should be expected. Um, but again, inclusion is not enough in some situations because um, because there was in this dance, right? In this dance, you know, it was fine if I was willing to do the waltz or the foxtrot, uh, which, you know, um, but when I was like, okay, let's salsa, right? Or do something else, then I was, then I was punished and ostracized. Um, and again, you know, like my CV is always up to date. So I was able to find another job that was bigger and better and whatever, but it still um, hurt by the fact that, again, this is an institution that said they wanted to be inclusive, right? That they valued um, my perspective. But the moment I brought a different set of values, right, into the space, um, a set of values that were a challenge to sort of a white European, male, cis, heteronormative, middle class, able body, able mind, Christian status quo, um, the power structures like came down like a hammer um, to, to tell me that I didn't belong, right? I didn't belong unless I was willing to conform and assimilate to those sets of values um, that, again, were detrimental to me. And so inclusion is not enough, again, without the real power to change that status quo. Um, and to to recognize that the those who benefit from this status quo again want to really hang on to their power. And so 
asking diverse peoples to dance to a white European, male, cis, hetero, middle class, able body and mind, Christian status quo, i.e. the power structure, is genocide to our spirits. Like part of like, again, they didn't fire me. Um, they just made it very clear that if I didn't change to their set of expectations, um, then they would make, they would, they would kill me socially, right? But for me to stay in that situation where I couldn't bring myself and bring the values that come with being me um, and the values that come from being deeply rooted in my community, then I would be killing myself, right? To stay, to stay in the institution, to stay in the company. And so I left. Um, but again, um, Inclusion is not enough and diversity is not enough um, unless you're really willing and able to change the power structure. So let me get to decolonizing design. Um, so decolonizing, they say, which is actually just me saying, <laughs> is giving the most vulnerable control of the street party. Um, although in COVID-19, this would be have to be done over social distancing, although what is that? There's the community in Brooklyn um, that, that I follow on Instagram that has like the best ever street parties. So it's possible to do so. Um, so what is colonization? So um, colonization um, is really about the elimination of indigenous peoples, um, polities and their relationships and from and with the land. So this is when, why the land acknowledgement is actually really, really important. Um, because if anyone is talking about decolonization and they're not talking about the elimination of indigenous peoples, um, then they're using decolonization as a metaphor and it's actually not a metaphor. Um, and so the purpose of decolonization is, you know, in the words of Eve Tuck and um, William Yang is to break the colonial setter triad, which means giving land back to sovereign indigenous tribes and nations, um, the abolition of slavery in its contemporary forms. And this, this is again, the, the, the call to the abolition of the police, um, defunding and abolition of the police um, is tied to that. Like that, the, the prison industrial complex is our contemporary expression of slavery. And then the dismantling of the Im imperial metropole, which is the way in which um, cities extract the talent, the wealth, the, um, the, that they center themselves so that you could only survive by leaving where you are to come to the city center. And whether that's like London or New York or LA or Toronto or whatever, the interesting thing about COVID-19 is that it's actually disrupted that. It's actually just the COVID-19 is actually dismantling in many ways the imperial metropole. So that's something to think about as we sort of um, define how we want to go forward sort of post-COVID um, in terms of like how we can use this moment to actually um, to push forward decolonization. Now, um, at OCAD University, we are the oldest and largest art and design institution in Canada. We are the third largest in North America. Um, and our origins come out of colonization, that of uh, the Institute OCA uh, was um, founded by what's called the Group of Seven Painters. Um, and, um, and particularly um, Franklin Carmarco, uh, who was an instructor there. And he is well known for developing the promotional materials for the Canadian National Railway. So preparing and painting all these beautiful, attractive images for Europeans to come to Canada in order to sort of colonize. And we notice even in other, all these landscapes, like there's no indigenous people, right? Um, so as an institution, OCAD has had to basically hold ourselves accountable for the way in which we have contributed to colonization. So when we teach in our art history courses, we have to own up to the fact that like, yes, 
the Group of Seven Painters put Canadian art on the map, but they also were deeply, deeply, deeply um, part of the colonial project, which has been harmful to our indigenous um, um, communities. Um, the interesting thing about that is that if we want what's happening with decolonization, and that's going to be the sort of second part, is that if we really want diversity and inclusion, we have to actually change the power structures in our firms and in our institutions. And so um, part of this is like the work that we've been doing under decolonizing design, which in the context of OCAD University, we talk about as respectful design. So I'm gonna take off my play you a cool video that our um, at OCAD University Faculty of Design, we practice what we call respectful design. Respectful design, what does it mean to the Faculty of Design? It means valuing inclusivity and people's cultures and ways of knowing through empathetic and responsible creative methodologies. It means deepening our relationships, the lives of materials and the cross making. The challenge facing design today is really to reestablish the relationship with nature. In other words, to design ourselves back into the environment. For example, adding the indigenous concept of seven generations to inform sustainable design. Good design takes a certain amount of humility. We have to recognize that we can do harm as well as good. It's about need over want. Respectful design means acknowledging different values different manners of production, and different ways of knowing. The widest possible range of diversity is with respect to ability, language, culture, and beyond. Designing futures with inclusion and belonging for everyone. Come join us here at OCAD University's Faculty of Design and find out what respectful design means to you. The thing that is super cool is that, um, so the individuals in that um, video were like my chairs and graduate program directors of the sort of design related programs. If I, and I probably will do it. So when I redo this video next year, cause like next year is the end of my fifth year. So when we redo the video at the end of the fifth year, every single person in that video, in terms of like our program um, chairs and um, graduate program directors, is a BIPOC person. So they're either black, indigenous, or people of color. So Latinx, um, Middle Eastern, uh, East Asian, or um, South Asian. Um, so that actually, in and of itself, like I, I really want to do the redo of this video, is like that is this moment in this video is the articulation point of a massive transformation in which even just in four years, all of the individuals who are the leadership of the Faculty of Design have changed. And so I'm gonna talk about like, again, what does it mean to be decolonizing design and, 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 and the work that I've been um, really, really um, amazed that we've been able to do um, at OCAD. Um, so I'm going to talk about it in terms of six steps because it's really important to, to think about um, what can and cannot be done and what's necessary to be able to do it. So the, one of the first steps that we've, we've done is we've put Indigenous demands first. Now, we've been helped out with that at OCAD because there is, um, in Canada, they had the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, um, which in its recommendations, I think it's like recommendation number 64, um, required that um, post-secondary institutions such as OCAD University um, address um, in their um, curriculum in some ways, the, the, um, they address the sort of um, the stealing of indigenous peoples into the system of boarding schools and, um, and in many ways begin a process of kind of decolonization. Uh, so at OCAD, we took that, um, and that was in 2015. So we took that as a sort of um, an opportunity to really demonstrate our commitment um, to indigenous, our indigenous 
community and indigenous colleagues. And so the way we manifest that is doing um, indigenous cluster hire, where we hired five new tenure and tenure track um, faculty members. Um, and um, it was part of our academic plan. So our principles of academic plan, our first principle is decolonization. Our second one is diversity and equity. Um, again, the Ontario Human Rights Code allows us to do what's called positive discrimination, which is if we can demonstrate underrepresentation, we can call, we can have a job search in which we say, if you're not um, self-identified as Indigenous First Nations people of North America or Turtle Island, do not apply, right? Um, this is a this has been transformational um, in the sense that um, it's given the space for our indigenous students to be able to claim um, their history and identity and make it the forefront of the way in which we approach things at OCAG University. And that's kind of represented in the uh, kind of graffiti of the image where I put up these boards saying what decolonization means to you. And it was amazing because I put it up at like three o'clock in the afternoon. And then when I came in, you know, around eight o'clock in the morning the next day, like the indigenous students had totally taken over the space, like totally taken over the space. And as a way to sort of, again, we've given them permission to claim space, but it's also changing our curriculum. So the picture of the Buffalo there is um, Howard Monroe, who was speaking in the video um, May Chief, which is the language of the Métis people. Um, he's been taking the seven grandfather teachings, which is um, really important principles, um, mostly tied to the Anishinaabe, um, and especially around the region where we are in Toronto, but it's kind of been um, um, fairly well adapted between sort of indigenous peoples in um, um, Turtle Island. Um, but he's taking the seven grandfather teachings and realigned the design process so that it's actually about the seven grandfather teachings. So in this case, the analyzed research design process, he's tied to the um, indigenous principle of respect. And again, respect is about how you position yourself in relationship to others. And so research is about you positioning yourself in relationship to the knowledge that others have. And so Again, these are the kind of teachings that we're bringing forth in terms of an indigenous epistemology of design. But what's really important again is that if you're, if you're, you know, diversity inclusion is not enough. If you're not decolonizing, um, that means you're not bringing in those indigenous perspectives. And those indigenous perspectives, like the in colonization, the original sin, so to speak, is the dispossession of indigenous people. So if you create a space in which indigenous people feel that they belong and have control over the institution, then you actually create space for everyone to belong. Um, second step is really owning up to the institutional racism and white supremacist culture. Um, so at OCAD, we had a presidential task force on underrepresentation, um, this is what allowed us to do sort of the indigenous cluster hire. I, we've heard, I, I organize workshops on um, whiteness without white supremacy, because one of the things that's really important is that the, the work of decolonization is actually the work of white people in the sense that um, it is white people who have built the structures of colonization. And so it is really important for them to be the ones to actually dismantle it. But they have to be, so the role, I guess, of sort of BIPOC people is to help them see the places where um, decolonization needs to happen, and then they need to be able to go in and do the work. And so the whiteness without white supremacy was really um, getting, again, at the time, my 77% white faculty to understand that they have a history, they have a culture, they have, um, they actually have trauma, right? Like, you know, no one leaves their home for a good reason. So again, many of the Europeans who came to North America, they suffered tremendous oppression there. And so they have to deal with their own trauma 
in order to not no longer inflict trauma on other people. And so part of building this sort of sense community around uh, understanding that we exist in a white supremacist culture in which we're all in, part of that is working again with the, my white faculty in many ways to help them see what role they play in this process of decolonization. And again, and we talk a lot about white supremacist culture. So this is the work of Tema Okun, where again, you have these values of perfectionism. There's only one white way to do it, individualism, uh, defensiveness. And what we're, what we're doing is like, how do we begin to cultivate these other values? So instead of progress, how do we talk seventh generation? Instead of, uh, again, sort of, uh, talking about the worship of the written word, how do we engage with multiple ways of sharing? And so as we sort of unpack what's happening in the institution and what our assumptions are about how the world works, we create space for other values um, to come into the institution. So the third thing is you also have to establish authentic relationships with BIPOC communities. And so <laughs> this is me. Uh, everywhere. <laughs> um, and, um, and part of it is really, you know, like, it's being present and being present, not just as an individual. So again, you know, we have had at OCAD Black faculty who are deeply embedded in, let's say, the Black community, but they're always embedded as in individuals. And so what was really important is that I be embedded, not just as an individual, but as a representative of the institution. And so for me, like one of my key moments to realize like, okay, I've accomplished this is like, I showed up this, at this community event and I like little peeked my head out and someone's like, like, oh, Cad's in the house, right? And so that was the moment where it's like, ah, okay, now it's the institution that is being present, not just me, Dory, as a person. And that's really important for institutions to be the, to do the work in so ways of actually really being part of a community. And some of that is sharing the resources, um, opening, um, opening up spaces, opening, providing um, access in many ways. I'm always surprised by how much power I have um, as the Dean of Design at OCAD University. Um, and in the sense that like, there are people who will take my call because I'm Dean of Design at OCAD University, the largest and oldest art and design institution in Canada. And so for me, it's been really important to take the, the symbolic capital of that access and in some ways help redistribute it to the communities who don't have access that they would never again pick up that call. And that's what to me, that's what being present in community as an institution really means is that you're opening up the institution to community so that they no longer actually see the separation. And so again, second key indicator that this was happening is that pre-COVID, um, my um, my EA Marianne was getting really upset because the community uh, kept demanding our spaces. Though, so they're like, "Can we, we want to have this event on November the twenty second, um, or the thirty fourth, or whatever? Can we come down and look at the space and whatever, whatever?" And and it was a thing where, um, like, she was not happy because she had to coordinate all of it, but I was quite happy because it meant that this black community which had felt ignored by the institution for many many years felt entitled to the space felt entitled to the resources of the institution which means they felt like they belonged to the institution and the institution belonged to them and so by being present again could be really annoying. And right now the thing that's happening is everyone keeps coming to me like to support their initiative. And I'm like, you do understand, like I have symbolic capital, but I have like no money. <laughs> um, but I also have symbolic capital, which means I can call someone who has money who could actually support what it is that they're doing. And so again, the community feeling that sense of entitlement is a really good thing because that means they belong that they see themselves belonging. 
And then one of the things that I'm super, super proud of is the call that we did for the applications for um, um, the Black Cluster hire that we just sort of, everyone's come in like in, in August, right? That we hired for this past year. Um, and it, I'm proud of it because it was, it provided a model in which you make an application about the community's interest and not your own interest. Um, and so in writing this position description, there's a couple of things that was really important. Um, one was the phrase lived experience. So that we were sort of making it clear that we were looking for black candidates who would bring their lived experiences into the community, right? Into our community uh, at OCAD University. And, you know, we weren't saying we were looking for an interaction designer. We weren't saying we were looking for an industrial designer. We were saying we were looking for people who could bring the interests that are important to, again, the Black community. So Black speculative futures, that's like a really important topic that's going on in our community. Multisensory storytelling as it relates to representations of Black lives. Hip hop and hip hop and other Black aesthetics, right? And so, um, so the candidates said, you know, when we were doing the interviews, they said like, you know, cause you're like, you know, why do you apply for the job? And it's like, cause I went through the job list and it's like black speculative futures. Yep. That's me. Representations of black lives. Yep. That's me. Hip hop aesthetics. Yes. That's me. In a way that if we said, I'm looking for an interaction designer, they wouldn't have seen themselves. And I know this because the people we ended up hiring, like, the struggle for us in the interview is that like they wouldn't say the word design. <laughs> like they were like, "We're I'm an artist. I'm a I'm a I'm a maker. I'm whatever." And I, and I kept just sort of saying, "Like, no, you have to say the word designer because my faculty won't accept you unless you say the word designer, right?" Um, but we found our way through it because um, because what we said was important is that what's your lived experience? What is of interest to you? And then we will figure out how that fits within um, how that fits within what it is that we need in terms of our teaching, in terms of our um, research, in terms of our student engagement. And then you have to change the standards to take into account systemic exclusion. So again, I'm also super proud of this work. Um, and I'm, I'm super right now we're getting ready to do another search and I'm doing the next, I'm literally writing the next iteration of this right now. And it was a thing where, again, we have these like evaluation criteria. So terminal degree, uh, demonstrated ability to teach a post-secondary level, record of research and professional practice, blah, blah, blah. And in our head, we have a persona of who that is. And so in a traditional academic, Again, I made that explicit to sort of say, this is, we've, we've only asking for people who have already been fully embedded in a post-secondary institution, right? If we're asking for two years of, of post-secondary teaching already, that means they've already been there in a post-secondary system for two years. So how are we, how are we bringing inclusion if our model means you've already been included, right? Like you, we, if we, we're aiming to bring those who've been excluded in, we actually need a, a different set of evaluative criteria. And so we came up with the Praxis Star, which saying, which was saying, like, if for some reason you've been rejected or um, alienated from the post-secondary institution, like, how would you still shine? So one way you might shine is through like, again, your industry relationships. So you may not be giving teaching in post-secondary institution, but you're giving talks and media workshops and whatever that you're not, maybe not, uh, again, signing, writing uh, contracts, or I mean, you're not applying for grants or things like that, or giving conference presentations, but you're getting small commissions or projects or things, which is convincing someone to pay for the work that you want to do, which is what we normally, that's what getting writing a grant from, and you're just trying to convince someone to pay for something that you want to have happen. So those skills may exist in a different form in a different context. That means we don't have to have relies completely on this traditional academic persona, right? Um, 
because that's exclusionary. And like I said, another area you might be engaging is as a community connector. So you might spend all your work in a community organization. You like having youth programs that you're sort of, that's the teaching aspect of it. You're writing sort of government grants or things to support um, your projects, all the stuff that we look for in terms of like a researcher writing a sort of grant. Again, these skills and knowledges exist, just not in the form, the persona form that we expect in. So if you're going to be inclusive, you actually have to remove all of the assumptions and barriers um, that have kept people out. And so the of the cluster hire that we had for the black cluster hire, you know, the top three candidates that what what, what I what I said to them, the instructions is that like, I don't want just your list of like the top five. I want your list of who's the top one person in each of these profiles, because that's whom we're going to hire is we're going to have who's the top candidate, who's a traditional academic, who's the top candidate, who's a Praxis star, who's the top candidate, who's a community connector, because that's how we build inclusion into the institution. And then last point is to hire in threes for critical mass. Um, so this is our black faculty as of June the 3rd, 2020. And there's actually one person who's missing. Um, so many different accents, <laughs> so many different backgrounds from so many different places, right? And what is really amazing was, um, and, and we spoke about this in our meetings is that no one felt obligated to hide their accent because in seeing the diversity there, they felt they can be themselves. And the other aspect of it is that they, again, like the, the kind of conversations and things that we had, like people were bringing their culture. They could feel like they could bring all of their lived experience of being black into, into the community because there was enough other people in the community who was saying, I see you, I recognize you, and can model that seeing and recognition for other faculty members as well. So like the, the cluster hire, they actually did the opening orientation keynotes uh, for um, the students and the faculty in the, in the new year, and it was completely transformative, completely transformative to the institution. But a thing like this happens um, because you have diverse peoples in three levels, right? So at OCAD, we have students who are at the entry level. We have professors who are at the kind of middle level. And we have me coming in four years ago, who's in a position of, of real power and influence. Like if I say no, something will not happen. <laughs> And that is actually having real power because there's a lot of things that I have to say no to to stop them from happening. But it also means I can say yes to something and it happens immediately. And so when, when people are talking about like diversity and inclusion, the only way in which you understand if your system of diversity, inclusion, and decolonization is working is that if your people who are at the entry level feel that there's real opportunities for growth, if the people who are at the middle level feel that they have influence, and if the person or persons who are at the, the top level have real power. And so when you're bringing in, and again, think about this as you're all in your, your forms or gonna create your own sort of businesses, think about like how you enable diversity to happen. And then you keep replicating that diversity in sort of threes until, the community says, you know what? I feel I can bring my whole self into this institution. And they'll tell you when you've reached critical mass. So in terms of like my journey, like again, getting to the place like OCAD University where my diversity is not only recognized, but I'm actually asked to help increase the diversity of, of the institution in and of itself that my 
being inclusive is not just again me being there and you know getting punished because I'm trying to bring my values but actually to use my values and that of others to transform the values of the institution so that more people will come in and then in terms of decolonization to do so with a real sense of commitment of changing the power structure in and of itself so that we have multiple models of what it means in this, in my case, in some ways, to be a leader. Like, why do I post on Instagram, Dean Drag, hashtag Dean Drag every day? Is that I want to model for uh, my students and other people, what does it mean to be authentically yourself in this position of power, right? It's authentically yourself. So it means you can dance Michael Jackson on a, on a Monday night. And that in no ways, affects your executive decision making when you have to go in the next day and make a decision because you're a real person with real lived experiences which don't end as you take on a role in an institution because all that we want as individuals and as communities is a sense of being having our authentic selves belong and to be cherished by our institutions and so that's me, the sort of arc of my career, what I'm up to right now. I'm super excited. Like um, we're about ready to embark on another uh, indigenous cluster hire. And so all of the things that I've learned um, from the previous hires we're putting into this and we're pushing the boundaries actually even more in terms of like diversity, inclusion and decolonization. And again, striving to get to critical mass. Um, but, um, but I guess my thing is to sort of say like, you know, there are points in my career, like the getting bullied out of my, my work that I, again, was really um, low, I guess, about the possibilities for change. Um, but I also knew I also knew that it's a cliche, like I had to be the change, but I also had to find the institutions that would allow me to flourish and grow and bring that change to those institutions. Um, and so I'm super, super blissfully, exhaustedly uh, happy about being at OCAD University and the work that we're doing around diversity, inclusion, and decolonization. And it's not, you know, like the media always tries to make it like an individual hero. It's like the whole institution has to be ready for this change and willing to do this change. But I won't undercut my own role in terms of, again, being a major accelerant of that change, um, partially because I just won't take no for an answer. <laughs> Um, and partially of like really doing the work to explain to my colleagues like why why this matters, why it is um, why the institution needs to open up spaces for belonging. And so I hope um, that you've gained something from this conversation um, that's useful to you in terms of again how you navigate your careers, but also how you navigate the institutions that you are engaged with as you um, build your career. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Dory. That was amazing. Um, and, and so, so wonderful. We're, uh, we'll open up for um, a bit of Q&A now. Um, and if you, you, if anyone would like to speak up, that's great. Or you can type your questions in the chat. There are no questions. Um, I'd like to ask, I wrote down a few questions, but my, my first question is, Dory, um, what do you see as the, the biggest mistake or the most common uh, way that institutions think that they're decolonizing or being <laughs> inclusive? And um, I, I think it would just be useful to point that out. I mean, 
-hmm. obviously we're a part of one and Mm -hmm. everyone is kind of asking these questions of themselves right now but maybe not doing it in the best way so I'm Mm -hmm. curious what you see is like a a trend that's not so helpful well one of the things I'm I'm really concerned about is um that many of these institutions and again everyone's making promises um that they're all looking for um what I call the super token um so again if you think of like like they're looking for the the superstar whatever label person right that not only meets the expectation of let's say in our model would be the traditional academic but exceeds it by 15 times greater <laughs> um and it's their way and and they do that because like, like i said they want diversity um but in some ways they don't want inclusion and and i and what i mean by that and i and i take it like i'm a super token right like again you saw my you saw my dance card right i'm a super token and so what happens is that institutions say like oh my gosh she's so she's so brilliant she came from like stanford and she is blah, 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 blah. and um that means she has the same values that we do that she has can speak you know i could talk about hanging out on the marguerites you know in silicon valley or whatever whatever those things are right i've been to those spaces i've been to those things and so they think that we share the same values and then so they and then again i'm talented right and i'm smart so they want that talent they want that intelligence to be useful again secretly or not so secretly because again part of the reasons why i think i've been bullied out of the places that I work is that they want they want that talent right um but they just wish it didn't come in the body of a black you know cisgendered female uh you know who whose mere presence in the institution challenges their notion of what is excellence right challenges their notions of what those values are so a lot of the a lot of the um places that are making their promises to hire for more diversity or whatever they're they're all looking for the super token um and the super token is dangerous in two ways like again they're they're dangerous to be positioned as a super token is dangerous in a couple of ways um again it's dangerous because um they want your talent and they don't necessarily want you and if you don't understand the distinction um you're going to get hurt really really badly in an institution um the second part is that by making the standards so high um they make it so that no other person right could actually be hired like for me the important part of like changing the evaluation criteria and all of that work that i've been doing changing the position dis- the, the position descriptions is about making sure that the institution does not use me to say oh we would hire more black people if they were like dory <laughs> and it's like you mean you would only hire them if they have a phd from stanford left led the us national design initiative worked in australia for four years to bring in indigenous perspectives like i don't even believe i exist on my resume right and so to be able to use me in that way is like really really for me something i've always worried about in the institutions so for me the relief has been at ocad is like okay i'm going to dismantle all of that because i don't and again i had there was a certain moment in the black cluster hire search where it's like i was like if you do this if you force us to only bring in again these traditional academic super tokens I will walk. <laughs> and I will walk in such a public way because I have my own PR person. <laughs> so I know how to get the media on my side. I will walk um because this is against everything that we're trying to do, right? Um so a lot of institutions right now they're only looking for diverse super tokens. Um and they and and, and again, everyone wants the most brilliant um but true diversity inclusion decolonization i always say only happens when i'm allowed to 
um, higher, mediocre, you know, BIPOC, queer, <laughs> Muslim people, right? Um, that's that's when we actually um, achieved a, a true equity, right? Um, but it's it's very, like I said, it's very dangerous right now. And like I said, a lot of um, CEOs, you know, here in Canada, we have like the Black North Initiative where 250 CEOs signed uh, this uh, pledge that they're going to uh, hire, uh, get to th hiring 3% of um, sort of black executives, which means they're adding one person because it's only like they only have like 12, you know, or whatever, five executives or whatever at the VP level. Um, and that's really dangerous in the sense that, like, again, that doesn't change this. They're, they're assuming that um, by doing this, they don't really have to change the system. They just have to bring diverse people who are willing to assimilate and leave all their lived experiences behind into the institution and not actually have to dismantle it. Sorry, that was a really long answer. <laughs> I'll try to be more pithy. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was great. Thanks. Is it late? Everyone's too sleepy to ask questions. Um, it looks like Alan has just put a question in the chat, um, yeah. so I will read it. Um, the first time I saw your rubric for the cluster hires, I thought that Praxis Star was an HR term. <laughs> it's brilliant. My question is, what were some of the category ideas, the spreadsheet columns that you considered that didn't make it to the final, but stretch the ideas around qualifications? Um, and he's added the second year studied unresumes this semester. Mm -hmm. Um, well, like I said, this one had a, um, this was like the first iteration of it. So it's, it had to sort of fit very closely to like the language that we used actually in the, in the call in and of itself, which again was biased towards a sort of traditional academic. Um, and so in that sense, we didn't, you know, like I, like <laughs> I pushed it as far as I could. Like I said, what I'm excited right now is that we're doing the next iteration of this 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 rubric in some ways for the indigenous cluster hire, and we're totally dismantling it. We're totally dismantling it. Like even right now in the position descriptions, we're using language where it's like, um, you know, we're we're assuming let's say you have like 13 years of work and lived experience um, in this particular area of design, and then you know, a master's degree is an asset. <laughs> um, uh, being uh, recognized uh, in, in indigenous knowledge systems, that's an asset, right? So we're taking that whole sort of thing where in some ways we're making, let's say we're making the community connector um, actually the, the preferred modality um, and then rewriting everything um, like all the academic stuff as if it's extra, right? As, as if it's not required, but it's extra. Um, and so there's some really interesting things that are coming out of those discussions. Cause again, you know, this process we're doing with um, our indigenous faculty. And so, you know, questions about what's of value to them. What are other ways of recognizing? Um, what are, you know, like, um, what's the what's the different focus on um like community and so so right now we're just completely dismantling like that whole structure and that whole system um and we'll see what like again all of these are like design iterations of which we don't know what the outcome is going to be we'll just take the risk um but um but it it's you know like we're 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 tearing that down, which then has set up interesting things. Like for example, um, I didn't use the word, we're not using the word curriculum, but we're using structuring knowledge. <laughs> um, 
that we've taken out, we actually took out the word sustainability and we refer to it now as like indigenous uh, land and water protecting or something. Um, and so, so now I'm thinking about like all of our interviewing process, all of our interviewing questions, like all of those are gonna have to be redone because of the way in which we've reframed this position description. Um, and so, <laughs> um, so again, it's like we're, we're, we, we are dismantling the notion of what is a qual qualification so that even the rubric that I've done now no longer logically makes any more sense to the institution. Um, Dory, I have a question since you mentioned the term curriculum. Um, mm -hmm. I was actually wondering about what that looks like now and, and how um, the course offerings or the or the structure of the program in terms of um, what classes the students take um, has mm -hmm. changed. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think one of the big changes that we've made is um, you know, and again, we get tons and tons of complaints about this. So again, you used to, when you come in your first year, you have to take art history and you would always take, um, you know, uh, European art, basically, it wasn't even called European art history. It was just like art history pre-1800, right? And then art history, the second semester, art history post-1800. And then we actually did have courses on like Turtle Island art history. So, you know, um, you know, indigenous art history for uh, North America. We had courses, we actually had a course on global art, um, global art history. Um, but those were you, what you took like as electives and maybe like your second year or your third year. So one of the things we did around decolonization is that we, we flipped it so that you first take, you have a choice to take either um, Turtle Island art history or um, global art history in the first year. And then you can take European art history or whatever in your, in your second year or as an elective. Um, and so, and again, that, that, is, that is so major, it is so major in the sense of like, there is so much pain uh, that our students have expressed about that original sort of um, encounter with European art history as, as the standard um, that, um, and this is the first year, although we're context now with COVID, but this is the first year where the students are able to, to make that selection. Um, and from what I'm hearing back is like, they're flourishing. There's another word to describe it, like they're flourishing because their first encounter um, with the institution is again saying, you know, indigenous art has a history and it matters or global art has a history and it matters. And the majority of our students are either, you know, first or second generation immigrants or indigenous, right? That's the majority of our students. And so, so to have that, validation of who you are in your first encounter in the institution um, sets you up really, really well to, to again, to value yourself and the, your tradition of making and bring that again into the rest of your courses. Um, and again, all of the other changes are really happening, um, you know, within, within the, the courses and the, um, in and of themselves. So like I said, you know, I described the bringing of the seven grandfather teachings to, to, to sort of be the design process um, to like, I think the manifestation of that is in our illustration program. Um, they, um, they normally have like the thematics where you do all these illustrations. And so they've actually, you know, for now a couple of years, the thematics are actually the seven grandfather teachings. So you're learning the value system, the indigenous principles of value systems. At the same time, you're building up your illustration skills, right? And so what we've been doing so much in our curriculum is that, like I said, we're not, um, we're changing the notion of what's the foundation of our curriculum. Like our foundation, our curriculum is not what happened in the 1800s in Europe, like traditions of making. If you're talking about Aboriginal, 
you know, Australian goes back 65,000 years. And so we're bringing that fulsomeness of like traditions of making into the curriculum, into the examples um, in such a way that like, again, our students um, see themselves, but also see each other um, in ways that builds respect for the kind of um, artistic and designly contributions that they are making and want to continue to make um, in the, in, you know, going, going forward in the future. And this shows up in the work, like, you know, my faculty have told me, and I, I, I can see it now myself, but like even within my second year, like the faculty said to me, like our, the thesis projects are changing. The thesis projects are changing, like, you know, like students are doing projects on, um, was it two years ago? No, last year, yeah, year before, there was one student who was of indigenous uh, Mexican heritage and her thesis project was, um, and she spent all year basically embroidering a book that was talking about like the history. And, and then for the thesis um, presentation, right? Cause we have a graduate exhibition. It was a thing where um, she, had an entire room and so you had to she had these projections and music and and foods and stuff and you had to actually undergo this ritual um and then it is only after you've undergone the ritual that you could actually see in many ways her codex right like the, the embroidered book um ah <laughs> don't ask me for names at like nine o'clock in the night but i'll find it <laughs> I'll, I'll send it later um but it's one of those things like that's the kind of work that our students are doing. They're doing typography based on like their grandmother's recipe books, um, the handwritten um, script of like their grandmother's recipe books, right? Um, they're doing, um, they're making, um, you know, they're making products or services that are like, there was one student who, who is Chilean and he did a service design project around how do you, um, how do you build empathy between the, um, the fighters who are coming down from the mountains back into the villages and, and developed a series of like um, games and processes to bring about that kind of um, reconciliation, right? So the work that the students are doing is completely different from what they were doing four years ago. And you know, I mean, that's what my faculty tell me because I remember their four years, but completely different. But I'm seeing it now that they are demanding that their, their thesis projects are a true reflection of who they are culturally, um, who they are in all of their nuanced identities, all of their nuanced identities. Um, in a way that, you know, five years ago, they might have been discouraged um, from their from press professors for um, doing that kind of work. Again, based on the notion, like as a designer, you do what the client tells you to do, which means you suppress your own desires or whatever, 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 in, in meeting the client brief. And um, that, that discourse is not very strong in the way in which the students do their work anymore like they they're like i want to find maybe that's like, like maybe it's just the wrong if that's the world then maybe it's the wrong client and i usually find clients then who again allow that space for me to bring the fullness of myself and my identities into the work that i do for them and so any client who's like please refresh yourself in order to be able to, to make this happen is not a client I want, right? Thank you so much. That's like such a moving and generous answer. And I feel like there's like, so often with um, like surrounding like the white European canon, there's like this scarcity based like panic of like what will be lost if we like don't teach this and I, I just feel like your answer demonstrates so much about about what is is actually gained um, so thank you so much 
and again, I mean, these are things that we've learned. Like we, you know, we've had our moments of panic <laughs> as well. But like, you know, like, you know, the kids are all right. Like they, they figured it out. They create the space they find. And, you know, and all we have to do is um, seed control and space over to them to kind of define what it is they want and need to do in order to, again, fully manifest who they are, right? Um, and then what's good, you know, about, again, being in places like, um, you know, Toronto, but I would sort of say you have the same affordances in places like New York, is that the community, the surrounding community is so diverse within itself, right, that you can, you can have those conversations with your industry partners to sort of say, hey, create a little space for, for this to happen. And what you will get out of this is um, originality and innovation, and they will challenge your way of thinking in a way that will help you continue to evolve, right, as a, as a company. Um, and, you know, the companies are, are willing, are open to hearing that. And I would say the zeitgeist we're in right now is that they're even more open to hearing this um, and following through. Thank you. Um, I want to encourage other people to jump in. Um, you, you can, you know, totally chime in with just a comment or, um, you know, a story or anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be a question. Um, would love to open it up and hear some more voices. So not to go through like people's like, you know, trauma, but has anyone else been ex experienced being bullied out of a place that they were working or an institution that they were at? Yeah, I, I, I certainly went through that in the academy. Uh, so, you know, eventually moving into higher ed admin and then you know, out of out of teaching and, and what I what I really wanted to do years ago. So it, it certainly is familiar to me. Mm -hmm. But actually, I was I, as you were chatting, I was thinking that you know our university, especially in the United States, is based on a 19th century model, and so this idea of this sort of like oh the breadth of Western history and university and you know things like Padua and all of this and all sort of pomp around, uh, 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 around the university. Well, actually our modern university is fairly young. Uh, <laughs> and so when I was reading uh, an article recently about the drop in, in, in um, you know, because of COVID in, in enrollments in the universities and the fact that liberal arts is significantly under threat as, as a consequence of, of COVID, uh, it got me to thinking, especially as I was listening to you, like, well, that maybe isn't such a terrible thing, you know, that maybe it is actually more of a symptom of a problem, not a symptom of COVID, but a symptom of a problem of relevance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have for decades really thought more along the lines of, well, when you get to the table, they shouldn't then say, oh, no, we're, we're done with that. You know, <laughs> like, no, no, let, let us read Plato too, you know. But, <laughs> You know, I wonder now, especially, you know, hearing the good work that you're doing, you know, if that all isn't just there anyway, I mean, we all lead such long lives. So whatever mm -hmm. educational foundation we give undergraduates and, and young graduate students does not preclude dipping into everything later in life. After all, we're, we're teaching folks how to learn for, you know, profoundly how to learn for the rest of their lives. So it's not an either or, it's just a, is this relevant? Mm -hmm. Is this model that's not that old, you know, truly relevant at this point? Uh, or as you say, are we perpetuating behavior that mm -hmm. is exclusionary uh, mm -hmm. and pushing people of talent out for no good reason than their identity walks into the room with them and it shouldn't, you know, their, their brain and their, and their talent should be the only thing that walks into the room with them. Uh, you know, I, I mean, not, not to take away from other identity, but not the, the negative connotations, you know, that, for example, that I, I experienced where it was like, oh, yeah, okay, we're really, we're really dealing with the gender thing, and we're dealing with the queer thing. You know, what a pain in the bloody ass that is, you know, <laughs> year after year to have to deal with that nonsense, uh, when really, you, you know, one should only deal with 
these are the ideas, you know, this is the education that I've worked very hard to get, uh, mm -hmm. that I want, you know, now to give back. So it's, it's just wonderful to hear, hear, hear the, that you've not only taken that idea, but you've actually brought it to life. This is remarkable. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dean Tumstall. I, you know, I, I waited decades to see exactly what you were saying, like mm -hmm. not just the invitation, but truly changing the, the way that the university works and doing it in a way that is successful. It isn't just like, well, no, no more white people, you know, <laughs> just chaos now. No, of course not. That's just bullshit. You know, it's, it's, it can be made better. It can be made stronger. It can be made more valuable. And perhaps as we're seeing with COVID now, you know, possibly more relevant, you know, mm -hmm. how to keep our universities open may, may really, rest on, on your shoulders uh, and those of your colleagues to, you know, who are saying it can be relevant, it can be meaningful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a thing which is really interesting with COVID because again, we're designed, so everyone's literally freaking out about teaching remote um, and saying it's not possible. And there's some things that's not possible, but it's, there was, when we did the analysis and now we're kind of into week number five, week number six, and we're looking at like, well, actually probably about 90% of the things that we thought weren't possible are actually quite possible to do. And we have the advantages of the fact that um, in some ways people are, um, like I said, we've dismantled the metropole, right? Like people don't have to fly all the way to Toronto in order to be able to do the work. This has really been important for um, indigenous communities, which one of their barriers was having to move to Toronto, one of the most expensive cities in the world um, in order to be able to learn. And so all of a sudden that barrier has gone away. Um, and there's such richness, like the richness of discussions that we're having around what is the what is existing in your local um, ecosystem of design to be able to support the kind of work that you want to do and how that work is actually shifting? Um, so we're gonna, you know, we came into COVID sort of saying like, oh my gosh, design is dead. There's no way we, how can we do something if we can't get into the fabrication studios, right? Um, but now we're sort of shifting as like, well. <laughs> These were all craft industries at one time and the other that was done kind of in people's homes or just relatively near or outside the homes in a workshop. Like, and so there's a way in which, um, you know, things might be possible again um, now that we've, um, now that we've been forced by circumstances to open ourselves up to other ways of doing things. Yeah. So like, yes, Alan, like, um, um, yeah, the canon is definitely one of them. And that, but in some ways, it's almost like that's the easiest thing to, to sort of tackle. Like, for, but for me, like, even to, to come to that realization, like, oh, even the term curriculum, I love the word curriculum. Um, but that's like, um, yeah, like that assumes an identity that, um, and we had, again, this struggle when we had our black cluster hire where some of our candidates were just tripping over the words, right? Tripping over the words. What do you mean by um, curriculum? Because they've never had to, again, they've been excluded from post-secondary, so they never had to put together a curriculum, right? They wouldn't even know how to answer the question. And so, um, but again, structuring knowledge, like, I'm hoping when I'm really hoping to come out of like our interviewing process is like some beautiful, innovative articulations of what it means to structure knowledge, right? That, that again, rubs up and challenges this very particular notion that we have, you know, that I have in my head when we say curriculum. So then let me ask a question then. So coming out of this semi-dialogue, because everyone's still sleepy, um, what for you might be the next step that you take in terms of like decolonizing the environments under which you have some 
um, agency or control. Um, I was really interested when you brought up um, creating authentic relationships as one of the steps, because it seems like a very obvious step and it seems like something that I'm totally capable of doing, which is make, creating authentic relationships with people in general. But it struck me because this year during COVID, I participated or I, I am participating in a mutual aid group um, that prepares food and gives away free food to the community in Queens. Um, but I recently sat in on an artist talk um, that was led by uh, indigenous and black women. And one of them spoke up about uh, mutual aid groups in Brooklyn who are made up of predominantly white gentrifiers who were coming in and creating mutual aid groups and saying, oh, we're so good right, we're doing mutual aid and they're all on Slack and not everyone has access to Slack. And everything she said basically was like a tear down of these, of these new mutual aid groups. And it just was the exact, um, the exact description of the one I'm participating in. It's like everyone who's in it has been in that neighborhood for one or two years, that's me. Mm -hmm. uh, like a white or white passing person, that's me. Someone who's like access to Slack, that's me. Um, and in our group, we've talked about creating authentic relationships or how mutual aid is like, it's for the community. It's not for us to feel good. It's not us giving charity. It's like, you know, it's a, it's a give and take. We, we, it's mutual aid. Um, so one thing that I'm working on or questioning is uh, how do I create authentic relationships with my community? the community that I am supposedly like uh, participating in. And, um, you know, if I, if I don't have authentic relationships that are happening with black and indigenous people, why is that? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think for me, decolonizing at this moment in my life is just like asking questions. Um, when I attend lectures like this and I, I get I get the advice and I'm like, well, I'm not doing a lot of those things. So why am I not doing a lot of those things? Or why is it hard to do those things mm. when they sound fairly um, accessible or doable? And it's hard. I mean, like, <laughs> like, like you saw the thing that was like first Friday. So they're like, for my first two years at OCAD, I went to every first Friday. So yeah, and these are events that take place every Friday from like, it always starts late because it's after work. So it's like, and it always starts late because it's CP time. So like, literally like you're showing up on a Friday night and like you show, I show up all bright hair, bushy tail, like 7.30. No one else is arriving till like 8.15, uh, 8.30. The event goes on, it doesn't end to 10 o'clock, if not 10.30. Um, but I went, you know, every week because that was the way to understand what was going and it's organized thematically. So like you were meeting different networking segments of the, of the community. Um, and it was, for me, it was the, 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 the way to understand who was who in the community and showing up every week again, you know, like people then got to know me and what I was doing. And then, you know, again, then coming in and making the offer you know, with generosity, so we say we have this program going on. We want to work with like community. Um, you know, what's your what do you need? <laughs> mm -hmm. And if I don't have it, I'll tell you I can't have it. I can't do it. But if I do have it, it's yours, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so it's hard. That was hard work. That was really hard work. But I knew, I knew it was. I knew that the work that we were trying to do as an institution would not be successful. If, if that work wasn't being done. And it's exhausting because it's not just, I, I don't just do that for the black community. I also do that for the indigenous community. I also do that for the LGBTQ, two-spirited community. And none of these communities overlap. So like my, my social calendar is insane because I'm trying to be present with so many different communities and to have again, show that there's that institutional reputation. So for me, 
what has been the big relief in terms of, again, having more capacity with a black cluster hire is that I've built all these relationships and now I get to delegate them <laughs> to other people to continue to maintain um, and build because I need to be building other relationships to be able to support kind of everyone. Like, so this year is the year that I've joined all the big prestigious board of directors. Um, and I'm doing that because n now that I have access to that level of sort of institutional power and whatever, that again, I can redistribute that back to communities. Um, and, um, but that means I can't be going to First Friday every Friday because I have to go to this particular event. But now, but again, the relationship doesn't disappear because now I send you know, Angela Baines to go to the first Fridays every Friday um, so that those um, those relationships can um, can flourish as well. So who else has a takeaway? What do you what do you want to take away from this? Um, hi, hi, uh, Dori. I'm Kwatadzo. Um, I'm a second year student in the program, so uh, I'm doing my thesis uh, project at the moment. Um, and I'm looking at um, how to, or, or looking at uh, natural uh, language processing tools um, in the context of uh, previously marginalized South African languages. Um, I'm, I'm South African. Um, and I think one of the things is that, I, that I'm trying to understand is how to um, create more equitable, inclusive um, tools. But in order for me to understand that, I feel like I need to understand what, what exactly I'm trying to achieve in terms of um, inclusivity and, um, and equity and what, what that looks like and what that means. And so one of the things that, um, that I've really appreciated about your talk is seeing within the context of, um, of, your, of your space, um, you know, what that might look like uh, to, to design, for example, uh, a hiring um, schedule that, is, uh, that achieves at the end of its, or that the outcome is to achieve um, a more, you know, diverse, inclusive staff. Um, and so I'm just thinking, um, you know, how do I um, create maybe even a design uh, or design artifacts or products or, um, you know, uh, yeah, how, how do I design things that achieve the, the, that help towards moving to the ultimate goal um, as opposed to maybe um, uh, just seeing the ultimate goal and then trying to kind of maybe tackle it as as a big chunk so to speak um so so thank you for that i think that's 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 my biggest takeaway from uh, from the talk that that small things add up um to, to bigger things yeah one of the great things about us being design and again having that um tradition of sort of participatory or cooperative um, design is that um, like, again, people are experts in their own experiences. That to me is what I love about design. So it's again, you know, like a, there's a, and I've, I've had, this has happened enough of a time, like it's a pattern. So it's the thing is if I'm doing um, research with someone, you know, again, hi, I'm Dory Tunstall might throw in the doctor or not. Um, um, but I could feel that intimidation. Like I can feel that they're intimidated for me with me. And then sometimes like at the beginning of the beginning of the conversation, there's a kind of chill, right? Um, but the moment you put down, you know, like ex example of this, we were doing, um, we were developing these um, brochures around financial um, information for a hospital. Um, and again, person came in, started off really awkward. Cause like I said, I, there was an intimidation factor. Um, 
but the moment I put the 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 brochure down and said, you know, you know, started saying, you know, well, how are you responding to this? How are you responding to that? Like everything shifted because all of a sudden this person was the expert, right? And they knew everything about what they're experiencing and how they're experiencing um, the design. And then they knew about what they would like, what kind of response they wanted to hear. But so the power dynamics shifted in the sense that like, again, um, if the intimidation was, I'm Dr. Dory Tunstall, who's the expert, but I don't know anything about this brochure. <laughs> so I, I'm the one who doesn't know anything, but they know everything, right? And then, and for me, um, why I think I love, like what I've loved about research and doing research and in, in sort of design as kind of opposed to like a, you know, like the classical anthropological training um, in some ways that I had was that, um, in design, you are never the expert. Like they are always the expert of the experience. And that in some ways can be an equalizer if you take that same approach of humility um, that you have in that moment where they're the expert and carry that into the other parts of the process, right? Because it's not just a matter of like, thank you, I've extracted your knowledge and now I'm gonna go do this. But if you carry that sort of sense of kind of respectful engagement into all of the other rest of the steps of the process, then you're able to kind of maintain in some ways that kind of equity, right? That kind of equity in the sense of that I recognize, I see, recognize and appreciate and remunerate in ways that are sort of um, valuable to you. Um, the, the knowledge and expertise that you have about your own lived experiences and how that affects the thing that I'm trying to create with you, right? And so design in some ways has an advantage in that way um, because built into, built into its notion is, is the fact that, um, again, the, the user knows, the user knows their experience, like, and that's, that's a needed and valuable part of, um, of the process. Kotatsu, could I urge you to um, bring in this notion that Jennifer was talking to you about, uh, like actually protecting the equity? Um, uh, could you say a little bit more? <laughs> oh, maybe that's Maybe that's next week's work. I was reading a recent email from her just in terms of like, you know, do you get do you get the indigenous language like data set into the system? The oh, okay. purpose of which is to extract value from it. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I think, in, I in think, the in the name of balancing out the the service. You know. Yeah. So so um uh I think I'm I'm uh remembering the the conversation that uh, Jennifer and I had actually. Um, where I was saying to her that one of the um, one of the conversations that I had with subject matter experts this week was around um, the fact that because um, uh, the dominant language is English, um, we almost no longer have a choice whether we're listened to or, or, or rather we are always listened to, whether it's your Siri or your um, uh, you're inputting text in, in, in search, you're searching for something. Um, because it's in English, you're always, um, that data is always being analyzed. So you no longer have um, a choice as to whether, a, cho a choice around privacy. Um, and so saying that um, we want to uh, include, you know, um, all of these languages um, in term in, in, um, in how, uh, in the tools rather, um, what does that mean for um, maybe the privacy that was, uh, th that, that maybe because Google can't hear you, you have a sense of uh, privacy within your community or within the, the spaces that you interact. But now to say, oh, okay, we're gonna take this, um, you know, we're gonna take the, uh, these languages and include them, but then the, the for as you were saying, for the benefit of 
um, you know, we can sell more product to you because we know what you're speaking uh, about or um, understand the, the, yeah, the, the dynamics of your community. And so take, take advantage of that because I, I suppose a lot of the time the, um, the data uh, belongs to all the processing power of the data belongs to you know the Googles and the Facebooks mm. um, who then have connections and um, uh, yeah maybe connections and, and agendas with with the data anyway that is oftentimes um, excluding um, the, the the people from which the, the data comes mm. um, so I think those those are um, the, the, that's that's some of the that that was the discussion um, around that. But then also, uh, I guess balancing it out between the real need, where um, because in South Africa, for example, branches are closing, bank branches, um, and bank branches were almost a um, a point where if you didn't understand English, you could come into a branch um, and have somebody who. Uh, looked like you, sounded like you, and understood your language to help facilitate um, the the thing that you were trying to do mm-hmm. um, in terms of your uh, your banking, for example. And now, if that is being digitized, and then the languages that that you speak um, are not represented on those technologies, then um, it becomes a problem. So, so it's almost like it's necessary to digitize the languages and have them represented, I guess, for contexts where, um, you know, uh, it's, it's almost critical to every day. Um, but then on the other hand, it's like, you know, it, it creates a potential for, you know, people to be, uh, kind of people and their data to be exploited. So uh, yeah. that, that I just put in the chat a link to the uh, Badong Fei um, Institute in Indonesia. And um, mostly I've uh, met this amazing researcher named Hogi um, Sintongkur. Um, and what I'm going to put the link to, so he's done a variety of projects, but the one I'm most familiar with is that they've done this work on fractals in. Um, um, Indonesian batik um, and so went through the process of kind of um, digitizing it um, creating a database um, working with the um, he works with the artisans to use um, um, AI algorithms to generate new fractal art that they can use in their um, use in their work right to sort of create interesting new patterns but also the website is um, is in um, Indonesian and uh, and other parts of it is only in sort of whatever the local language is that he wants. Um, so that in some ways he's, he's kind of, um, because one of the big issues that they fight against is that um, sort of uh, European design um, designers stealing the motifs um, and the patterns from the the Indonesian um, artisans. So in the process of documentation, he's actually been able to trace, um, go legally protect the work of Indonesian artists against European theft because he's been able to trace the the evolution of the fractal patterns back into sort of like the the Indonesian history of that community and sort of say, this is where this actually originated. And I have the mathematical computational models to show you how this particular work is a derivation of this original work. So you can't take that. And he successfully sued uh, European companies for stealing um, indigenous patrimony in that sort of sense, right? Um, but again, also, also again, building the website in local languages as an exclusionary tactic, right? Like I said, if you don't read the understand language, you don't actually know what's going on and you don't necessarily know how to use the database. And he said like he was intentional and strategic <laughs> in that particular way of doing that, right? But again, 
in the work that he does is that, you know, again, all of these things are tools. So you can use computation to exploit, but you can also use computation to, um, to protect, right? And it's just being very intentional. And like, again, anyone that's part of the artisan groups or whatever, like they're free to use the database in any way that they want. Right, like I mean, not still from each other, but there's like you know community respect, so they don't do that anyway, right? Um, that they're free to use it, you know that 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 everything that they learn and they teach, they also teach, you know how to use and learn whatever the community in and of itself, because the primary use of the tool is for the community, um, and so and like I said, there's there's a lot of benefit in terms of um the documentation and the computational um rigor that's been built into the process that like i said it could it's it has been used to actively protect communities from exploitation and um, thank you so much for for that i'll definitely look into his work mm -hmm. Any more questions? My brain's going to shut down officially in eight minutes. <laughs> yeah, if anyone has questions, please chime in um, for the last one. But I also want to respect everyone's time because we're inching towards, well, it's nine. Oh, it's it's 10 Eastern time. Uh, it's almost nine for me. Yeah. So not to call you out again. Joy, do you have any questions now that you have me as a captive audience? Hmm. Um, no questions right now, but um, kudos to say thank you for sharing this. I've known you a long time and I actually never really heard you pull, tie the thread together through your experiences and how that led to your work at OCAD. So. Hmm. Uh, it was really wonderful to see that come together um, and to see, like reflecting on the past almost five years, your work at OCAD. So, um, mm -hmm. so thank you. I feel honored to have been able to, to experience this and to see where it's going. So, okay, we officially need to catch up. <laughs> we do. And thank you um, for, for letting me um, sit in on your class um to 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 everyone else I, I appreciate you letting me let me jump in um yes thank you thank you so much for attending um well on that note i also want to say thank you and and this is a very generous guest lecture and we're, we're so lucky to hear about your experience and um you gained an Instagram follower from me as we were Yay. speaking. So I'm looking forward to seeing your dances. <laughs> every day. <laughs> well, that's, they're normally not, the dancing's not every day. It's just, I'm doing this voting dance every day. So there's nice. all this like voting real songs or whatever. Um, so I do a voting dance every day until election to encourage everyone to vote. But nice. there is there is an expression of joy every single day. Yes, so, there is. <laughs> That's great. You know, a day has gone by when you see the new a new Dory outfit and. It's <laughs> but yes, thank you, Dory, and thank you everyone for attending. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to see the students and our new guests here, and uh, we'll be following you and seeing what you're up to, Dory, mm -hmm. for sure. Thank you. So thank you, actually, Ellen, for the invitation, um, and. And thank you, Christina, for moderating, Elspeth, for all the great questions, um, and all of you for like um, contributing and, and listening um, um, openly. So I, I really um, appreciate it.